Just to uh, just to set the scene, I'm sure you're, you're sort of all aware of this. this. This is something that Derrico produced a very very long time ago, and it, it just um, justifies the need for reseeding and keeping new and good quality grasslands in um, in the livestock farmers' rotation. So this is based on a, on a dairy farm. You've got the age of the lay, um, a year old, going down to seven years old, and as that lay ages, so the quality decreases. The, the uh, ME uh, reduces. And, no, sorry, sorry, the yield reduces, and obviously as, as the lay ages, so, and we get more of the indigenous species start to, to take part in that sward, so you're losing megajoules of energy. This is the amount of, of uh, megajoules of energy you're losing per hectare. That's the subsequent uh, cost of milk loss on, you know, once that sward's got, by the time it's sort of four years old, you've lost 0.6 of a megajoule of energy, which doesn't sound a lot. You've probably lost a couple of tons, two and a half tons of dry matter, that's 36,000 megajoules of energy. 5.4 megajoules of energy to produce a litre of milk. That's an awful lot of milk. It costs a lot of concentrate to replace it, and it's a lot of milk loss. That's at a milk price of 25p. So it's crucial, and I think at the moment we're finding livestock farmers, they're far more switched on to improving forage, all the livestock guys. It doesn't matter whether they're dairy or whether they're beef and sheep. So that's just to um, set the scene, really. Um, I don't know whether you follow sort of King's Hay or whether you see any of that sort of da data. What we see um, in the commercial world is that we've got some very good performers at the top end, top sort of 10, 20% of livestock farmers. They're producing about 4,000 litres of milk from forage. It doesn't matter whether they're sort of lower output. These are probably grazing guys, whether they're medium output or whether they're sort of at the higher end of milk production. And that's perhaps not terribly high, you'll say. But, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what category of milk production they fall into. You've got the very best guys producing, getting on for 4,000 litres of milk from forage. And then you've got these guys at the bottom that are struggling to make 2,000 litres of milk from forage. The significance of that is this. The overall cost of their production is up to 2p per litre more for the guys that can't get enough homegrown forage into the, into the, into the livestock. doesn't matter whether you look at that in dairy sector, whether you look at it in the beef sector or the sheep sector. Um, sector. It's crucial to, um, you know, to all of them to get more homegrown forage. So this is sort of thing that we're, well, everybody's talking about it, I suppose, at the moment, but it sort of sets the scene for making sure that we've got, um, you know, good lays with a high percentage of perennial ryegrass in those swards. This is a John framework uh, Alan referred to, and by the time these swards are five years old, uh, it's a natural population of, of, of um, seeds within the soil start to dominate varies on management. Somebody mentioned pH. So if you've got a good pH soil and you've got good P and K availability, perennial ryegrass will want to be the dominant species. It will grow well for you. But generally speaking, as the pH drops, depending on you know, how it's treated on management, you start to get this weed ingress. And then we see the sort of the, um, the, you know, the resultant loss of, of income that we saw on the other two slides. What's the problem with these um, indigenous species? Well, they don't yield as much, as much, um, you know, as much dry matter, and they're also much less quality. So a lot, a lot lower dry matter. Yorkshire fog. I'm not sure who we've got next. No, Yorkshire fog. I think the D values in the mid, mid um, the, the high sort of 60s. It's not too bad a quality, but it doesn't really matter. You know what the texture of, of Yorkshire fog is? Nothing elite anyway. So um, rough stalk meadow grass. The meadow grasses are the most common weed grasses that we see, much lower yielding and much lower quality. And then we've got the bents, which we won't even mention. So it's a serious loss of yield when we start to get this uh, weed grass um, ingress, ingress into those swards. Now, um, I'm an anorak when it comes to recommended lists, a complete nutter anorak, and I get, get quite keen on it. But, you know, you'll have guys growing cereals, yeah, wheat, barley, and that sort of thing. They will pour over a recommended list. The highest yielding wheat variety and the lowest yielding wheat variety, that was the price of, um, of wheat, I think, the other day I was looking at there. About 900 and, well, less than a tonne difference per hectare when it comes to cereals. Admittedly, that's the grain. So the difference between the top and the bottom variety is about 150 quid a hectare. It's quite a lot of money. Anybody hazard a guess what the difference in income is between the highest and the lowest yielding ryegrass variety? So we've got Italians that will yield 19 tonnes and more. The lowest is around 16. Silage, 
120 tonne, a, a, a 120 pound a tonne of dry matter, something like that. So the difference in grass varieties is huge. So varieties do matter. They're hugely important. Okay. Now, that's yield alone. Just looking at yield alone. This is the grazing data from the 18-19 um, recommended, uh, recommended grass and clover list. So there's the average. Here's the highest yielding ME variety, and here's the lowest. Kilray, that is. It's an early. It doesn't really matter. So... They're still good varieties. They've made the recommended list. The average is around 130. The highest yielding megajoules of energy is 140,000, and the lowest is 120. So still good varieties, but the difference between the top and the bottom is 40,000, no, sorry, 20,000 megajoules of energy. That is a lot of milk. That is an awful lot of live weight gain on anybody's, um, uh, on anybody's farming system. So varieties are crucially, they're absolutely important to what you put in your, in your mixture. This is a little bit, I've got to thank Alan for this. He sent me this, uh, this information some while ago for a different talk. He's already said that sort of um, most of what we do here is the, um, the perennial ryegrass diploids and then tetraploids, and they're the, the intermediate and late heading diploids and tetraploids. That's good because it's sort of 80% of the market, 80% of the forage market uh, 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 is perennial ryegrass, intermediate and late heading, and that's what we as germinal major on. We hardly, uh, hardly market any earlies anymore. Um, and uh, we have obviously a good uh, hybrid program as well, but that's, that's the bulk of what we do. So those are the four year plus lays, you know, anything over three years old, there's a, a very high percentage of perennial ryegrass, intermediate and late heading, if not 100%. Um, progress, Alan, I think, did you put this slide up? You put something similar, but basically between the sort of the early 80s and, and 2000, we've seen this sort of 30% gain in diploid performance in the gain in diploids probably a little bit less in the tetraploids, but significant gains, over 30% increase in yield in that period of time, in that sort of, what, 20-year period. Um, yeah, so a gain probably of around 2% a year, just under that in the, in the grazing, and the D value, about half a percent a year it was increasing during that period of time. This is the one you used, isn't it? So you can see there, Talbot was the older variety in Magic. Over three tonnes difference, increase in, in, uh, in water-soluble carbohydrates. And Alan mentioned how, you know, significant the high-sugar um, breeding programme is here. And, you know, sort of years ago, I remember people talking about tetraploid power, and they were saying that tetraploids were high-sugars. They're not all high-sugars, just as diploids aren't all high-sugars. And we will see varieties that they claim to have high-sugars. What you will see is that the ABBA varieties the difference between our varieties and other varieties, though sugars fluctuate during the day, and during the year, there's a parallel line. Even if it's a curvy line, the difference is always constant between the ABBA high sugar varieties and um, you know, the other material that's out there. So significant improvement. Um, we've talked about sugars really, but you know, that, that's, that's sort of independent science, totally independent science. We know that ruminants are very, very poor converters of fresh forage protein. Something like 70% of it comes out of the animal, either the front end or the back end or wherever. So they do not capture enough fresh forage protein. Adding sugars, I'm old enough to remember chucking a bit of molasses and sugar be in, I'm sure a lot of people still do, helps reduce the losses uh, to the atmosphere and it improves the animal output. So if we can increase the sugars, um, you know, we're going to get this effect of, 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 of less waste to the, uh, to the environment and more live weight gain, more milk and so on. So farmers sort of think it's because it makes them taste, taste sweeter. It's nothing to do with palatability. Though if a lot of them will say, gosh, that high sugar grass is really sticky, you know, but it, it's, it's not palatability. It's, um, it's room and efficiency at the end of the day. Um, Alan's touched on these, so I'll skip on with that. Um, legumes. Leif, I hope you're not going to do too much on this, like on the, on the legumes, but um, I've just got a couple of slides. So the other things that are new here, we've got the five-year red clovers, so you'll have heard, I hope, of Abaclara and Abacianti. Um, so the breeding programme was focusing on increasing the yield in the third year and beyond. So traditionally, red clover lasts for five, uh, three years, and you will really start to see it dying out. Some of them are much shorter term than that as well. After three years, you know, it's... Uh, it's diminishing quite considerably. So improving the, the yields uh, after the third year, grazing tolerance and uh, pests and diseases, so sclerotinary and stem nematode and all those other pathogens. 
That's about improved crown survival and improving the overall quality. The other thing they're looking at with the clovers is this uh, PPO, polyphenol oxidase. That, I believe, is protein protection. So um, it stops the protein breaking down quite so quickly. So we, we would have called it sort of bypass protein. Um, so it's not this fizzy protein that you lose in the rumen. It works in the, um, further in through the digestive system of the animal. This polyphenol oxidase, is that the one if you cut an, an apple in half? It, um, it's what stops it breaking down, isn't it? That's the polyphenol oxidase. Right, um, so Abaclara, Abacianti, this is the data from the four-year trial, and you can see the yields in the fourth year there. Mervy, it's going backwards. Milvus isn't quite so bad. Pirate, I can't remember what's happened to that one, but it's not been on the list for a very, very long time. We've seen a lot of these varieties now actually in the field, and they do persist for five years. You know, you can recommend them. And, and promise that they'll still be there five years later. So obviously, you know, we're reformulating grass mixtures. Traditionally, it, uh, red clover mixtures, sort of with Mervy, it would be Italians and hybrid type varieties. Now we're mixing, um, you know, uh, Abaclarat and Abacianti with perennial ryegrass because we need the grass to last for the five years as well. Um, and, you know, we're having a lot of success on that in farm, which fits in quite well with the rotation for a lot of people. Um, this is quite exciting. So uh, David's there and we've got the new, uh, well, it's not a new variety yet, but we've got uh, not a, a commercial variety at least, but red clover with stolons. So they've identified, these are the um, space plant nurseries for sort of, well, random red clover cultivars that they've, they've selected from, I'm not quite sure where. And then over a period of time, we've spotted various um, of these plants that are actually growing. So that's still one plant. And you can see we've got this stoloniferous growth on it. That could be a big game changer in the red clover market going forward. That's quite exciting. I hope we get some while I'm still, before I retire. <laughs> okay. Uh, white clover. Okay, so, you know, we've obviously a very good portfolio of um, ABBA white clovers anyway. Cross with the Trifolium ambiguum, um, it, which produces this. Um, so that's more of a ball root type clover, the rooting. It's not quite so stoloniferous, I don't think. And it's got higher tannins and better, better um, um, flowering. Basically, cro crossing those two together, we get stolons as well as rhizomes. So, you know, white clover has this um, stoloniferous growth. So the, the roots go across the surface of the ground. Um, Abelasting, which is this one here, that has stoloniferous growth and rhizomatous growth, which gives it greater persistency. And I saw a photograph of the root mass of that the other day from the uh, Phenomic Center, and it is very, very dense rhizomatous growth underneath the plant, as well as stolons. So that's, you know, potentially there's, uh, well, we're seeing quite a growing market for it at the moment. And there's another picture of it. You can see this is, in, uh, I think that's the drought. Um, a drought testing that they were running on it there. You can see the difference in the uh, how it's coping with the drought. That's quite exciting for the future. That's uh, They're doing some seed production in New Zealand and you can see here the stolons. That was when we, were, we went and had a look at some and those are all the stolons in the uh, in the seed crop in New Zealand of the uh, Abelasting. Why do I recommended list matter? I don't know how I'm doing for time now, but why do recommended list matter? Well, there are hundreds of varieties that go up for testing. And there are approximately 70 varieties that actually get onto the, the UK list, the, the list that we use here. So they've got to be as good as or better than what's on it, or bring something new to the party to actually get there and stay there. Some are of a bit of a one-hit wonder, and some of them manage to hang around for quite a few years, sort of like Abba Dart, maybe. Um, you've got this list here. So that's the English list, the Scottish list, there's a Northern Irish list, although it's not been reproduced. And the Irish... Sorry? England and Wales, sorry, did I say England? Yeah. yeah, that was a bit of a slip, wasn't it? How could I have forgotten the Welsh? Um, yeah, uh, so anyway, yeah. The England, England and Wales list, the Scottish list, and the Irish at Cheggers, they actually put um, a financial va value on them, I don't know. Any, okay, thanks, anybody's heard of the PPI? But they actually look at spring growth, seasonal growth and persistency, and they look at quality, and they give them all a financial value for all those traits, and then they add them up, and then they rank them in order of the most profitable varieties, what they can bring to a farmer. And there again, you've got the success of your ABBA, ABBA breeding. That is under the Irish system, you know, from, uh, so it's, it's sort of block carving, rotational grazing system. They do include silage in it, but it's, it's quite interesting that um, 
ever since they brought the PP out, I think we've had at least seven or nine of the, or eight of the top ten. So that's very good. Block carving guys are asking for these varieties now because they, you know, they get to, they actually see this, this, they actually go and see this data, this work in Ireland. Um, improvements. So these four varieties here, um, I think they came onto the list between about 1998 and sort of like 2005, I think Glenn Stoll was. So this is, this is the current uh, recommended uh, list. So that's the, the list that we're working on now. That's the average of all the varieties. These four varieties are probably at least 15 years old. And those are the varieties that have come on in the last two years or two or three years. So you can see the development. These are still good varieties. They're still on the list. But you look what, what difference there is between sort of say 2005 and 2017. 2000, uh, yeah, 2016, 2017. So that's where we are, just ch selecting varieties. So, so always use your recommended list, but look through the, your list and you know, pick varieties that are, are doing the, uh, that are doing better. So these are the intermediate tetraploids. You can see the difference between Glenstyle and Abbas Bay. So the previous slide was grazing yield and quality. And then this is conservation yield, total yield in year one and, and uh, is the blue line and the red line is yield in year three. So you can see Abba Spey against Glen Stahl, Abba Zeus against Abba Dart, and then Abba Gain against Twimax and, uh, and so on, Abba Ban against Can Can. So tetraploids, diploids, uh, late tetraploids and late diploids there. There's quite significant improvements when you start to just look in between the individual actual varieties, even though they are all listed. So what have we seen over the last 10 years? The Adber intermediates, we've got up about sort of 2.5% in D-value. And versus other varieties, if you take the other varieties out, that's even more significant. Continuing this improvement in yield, and I think we'd already covered that sort of over 30% improvement in the Abba diploid specifically, grazing and conservation. We're looking now at this Abba Zeus and Abba Ban. And uh, also, you know, 15 to 20% improvement in tetraploid yield. So it's Abba Gain now, Abba Bite, oh, can't spell. And have a plentiful. Oops. Um, okay. So um, when you're reseeding, when you're recommending, advising people on respeeding, reseeding, obviously selecting mixtures to suit their system. Um, but then consider the method of reseeding, um, whether it's a complete renewal or whether it's a rejuvenation. And then would urge you all now, there's no real control for soil pests whatsoever. We see a lot of those in, in the older lays. If you can get them to use break crops then that's going to be, help them considerably and it could in, um, help them, um, you know, if uh, it could help them sort of fill a forage gap in the summer. So sort of we had a drought last year, the people that had been brave enough to put a brassica in, in in May or June, you know, they had brassica grazing all summer and then they were back into a following crop in the autumn. So using break crops such as brassicas and then uh, always use your recommended list. I'm bound to say reseed regularly, aren't I really? I'd got a little bit on other forage options, but I've got a feeling I've run out of time. Well, very popular at the moment is multi-species, okay? So, um, main grasses, we would use a perennial ryegrass, Timothy, if it's wet and cold, and uh, the herbs, the main herbs are plantain and chicory, and then legumes, it's mainly red and white clover. There's lots of others that do get thrown in and that will be requested for various reasons, but basically, our rule of thumb with multi-species is keep it fairly simple and use the agronomic, you know, the varieties that we know are going to be agronomically proven to perform in our country and on our livestock farms. Okay, so that's, but I'm not saying don't use these, there's not a place for them, but we like to keep it quite simple. And uh, there's all sorts of work, you can look at multi-species um, grazing that they've been doing in, in um, is it Tommy Malone at Dublin, UCD? They're doing quite a bit of work on, on different formulas of multi-species. That's quite interesting. And essentially, this is the sort of thing that's performing the best. Um, plantain and chicory. Plantain, yeah, we all know what it looks like. Chicory, we all know what chicory looks like. This is another talk completely, obviously. Um, and then uh, that's just perennial ryegrass. I think that's HSG. We, we would call that HSG3. So it's all diploid, intermediate and late heading. There's white clover in there and about half a kilo of plantain and about 0.4 of a kilo of, of chicory. That's on a sheep farm down in um, Cornwall. Guy, in fact, he was sheep farm of the year that year as well. So that's the sort of blend that we try and produce, getting very popular. It is a multi-species. We don't necessarily it as a multi-species, but you've got the combination of all the other species in there. 
phenomenal live weight gain and uh, you know anthelmintic properties as well to that. Multi uh, yeah, multi species again here. That's yeah, that's a sheep guy. That's on a Cotswold brash. The next one really moving swiftly on to another species is just brassicas and um, all sorts of brassicas the most versatile and the most flexible really is something that you can sort of sow any time between May and probably halfway through August and that would be either for summer or autumn or even wintering out wintering you know um, this was work we did in the uplands that's that's at about 1300 feet just round up and an old strip cedar drill but it, when I say she just round up, it was lime, the P and K were right, you know, and we fed the crop. So that, you know, that was gonna grow. There was no risk of that rotting to the extent that, uh, that it would impede the take up of the brassica, the grow of the brassica. That was the same. I don't know if you know the Woodhead Pass, but he just round up that and rotivated it and spun the seed on on his bike. And that's, you can see that's, anybody know why Warcliffe in the Peak District? That's the tower at the top there. Can't quite see it. Manchester Airport's down there in the corner, right down there. And that's that crop from that field. That one on the right. So that's the same field. Um, and he went into grass. He, he fed that all autumn and uh, sort of, I think he lambs in sort of February and then they went back out on two other lays and then he reseeded that the following year. Cows block grazing, uh, rotate, well, strip grazing it in the summer. Um, Always feed fibre with brassicas. I'm sure you all know all that. That's one of these, I'm not sure what you call it. I call it a whirly gig, but each day he pushes that over and he gives them another metre. So it's quite a handy way of um, actually feeding your brassica. He knows exactly how much he's feeding them. That's just a summer break crop on a dairy farm in Staffordshire. Swedes in the, in the uplands, that's Rob Powell there, might be known to some of you. And you can see he's, he's trialling a new variety of Swede for us there called, um, called Triumph, indeed. There we are. That's another one, that's, that's the Welsh Hills in the background as well, so there we go. So brassicas, yeah, cheap to grow, lots and lots of benefits and uh, just um, help reduce costs, crop rotations and so on. Um, really, uh, what we're sort of saying to farmers, and I'm sure you're the same, is you've just got to know their starting point, soil testing regularly and so on, and measuring or recording output, whether that's bales per field, stocking rates per field, trailers per field, if they're, if they're block carving and rotation and grazing, they'll be plate metering and they know exactly how much they're growing and exactly how much they're utilising. And those guys pinpoint the field that's not performing on their, on their grazing wedge. It shouldn't be any different for anybody else, you know. So it's just about attention to detail and getting them to actually make those measurements. There's an old adage about measuring and, and managing, which we won't bother about, but it's, it's so true. And then, you know, they say, well, where do we start? Well, you just find the underperforming field the underperforming field that you can improve. You know, don't go and pick the hardest, something where you're gonna get your easy gain, your quick gain, your easy gain. Use a break crop, pick varieties from the recommended list. Devalue rules. That's my, my yeah, yeah, that'll say that on my epitaph, I'm sure. So. Okay, so the future world, I think Alan really sort of covered it, but, but it, I don't know where yield will finish up. Obviously, it's going to keep increasing. From a farmer's point of view, they don't see disease, see disease resistance. You know, it's part of those agronomic traits that we can record easily and we can take the benefits of those and we can sell them to the farmer. Future traits, I probably can't spell lipids by the look of it, but, um, you know, nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, this root architecture thing, they're big things going forward. They're going to make significant differences. They're what make the breeding here absolutely, completely and utterly unique. So that's it. Thank you. Really interested in our Irish financial value. Yeah. And, and you were talking about 20,000 maybe joules difference to best of us varieties. Mm -hmm. um, roughly, what would the price per hectare of seed be between the best and worst varieties? Seed cost? Um, probably. Probably as little as f a fiver. Depends on. I mean, we're wholesalers, so we don't. Um, we don't sort of quote retail prices but sort of a ballpark figure for our sort of best sort of sheep grazing mixture would be about 65 quid you can find any range any number of sheep mixtures on the market grazing mixtures on the market some will be 
45 quid. Anything that anybody's sort of making any good claims to from a reputable merchant and a reputable wholesaler is probably only going to be a five. Some will be at the same price, but sort of, you know, a few quid. And that's a five year lay. Oh, per acre, I beg your pardon, per acre. Yeah, sorry, I'm old money per acre. No, 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 it's very easy to justify. It is, it's, um, you know, we, some of you may have seen this use, they, uh, we've got a little spreadsheet where we show them, you know, the just, just sort of increasing your yield and increasing your, your ME by about half a kilo, half a, yeah, half a megajoule, sorry. It's just significant, the amount of megajoule, extra megajoules per, per hectare that you can produce just from variety selection. Yeah, um, Alan mentioned uh, a few times on the public goods, um, and you've also mentioned some trades there that you're working into the, into the program. How important do you think, think that is well, now and looking into the future, whether you're selling seeds to a farmer or recommending seeds to a farmer? How important uh, will those trades be? How important? Is I think the trades will be hugely important to the farmer. I mean, a lot of them now, you know, the, the, the high sugar one. I always felt sort of, even when I joined Germinal, that the varieties were so good anyway, we didn't need to talk about high sugar grass. We'd got the D value, we'd got the quality anyway. Um, and, and I think it was kind of a little bit lost on the farmer. But, but what we see nowadays, I don't know whether you know, you work with farmers probably more than I do. We've got a very discerning bunch of, of, of younger farmers coming through. Every time we, we've had a meeting, a farmer's meeting in the last sort of, well, certainly 18 months, it seems as if the average age of the farm is actually going down at last. And, you know, they're, they're really progressive guys who are really into this. They're really interested in it. So I think going forward, I think they will be, there will be significantly, you know, there will be a great deal of interest in it. How we would actually promote it, well, I'm sure we'll have a discussion about how we actually get it out there. But that, that lipid thing is enormous, you know. And we only, so you, your VFAs are only about sort of 4% of the plant. And you only need to influence them very, very slightly to get a significant improvement in megajoules of energy. And, and it also has a huge impact on methane. Something, what, what's the methane figure for it, Alan? I, I can't remember, but it's significant. And so, you know, as we're sort of looking at these, I mean, we work with various sort of, uh, sort of organisations, sort of supermarkets and so on, and people like that who have uh, to produce um, carbon footprints for farms. I and mean, if they start to look into that level of detail in future, that could be huge. That could be very, very important, you know. If we, can, if we can prove that, which we will be able to, those sorts of benefits to the environment and, and you know, the public good traits, as Alan said, they could, be, they could be very important. Good question, thank you. Um, you yourself, well, um, Alan has talked about it, and you yourself has got to sell it. <coughs> A lot I give it away. Being produced by genetic manipulation, shall we call it, in the wider sense. Yeah. When you're talking to, um, you know, a rep or the farming community, how do you turn this aspect of genetic manipulation without trying to run into the problems that Monsanto had, you know, um, 10, 15 years ago? Or Alan was coming up. Are we genetic? Are we? Are we? Yeah, I mean, ge genetic breeding. Yes, you could call any breeding genetic. I, I know that. Yes. <laughs> so, you know I mean, that. we just talked about it as conventional breeding, which I think uh, resonates with a, a lot of farmers because they breed, breed their cattle. It's, that's all that's going on. It's the equivalent of farmers and you have animal breeding. But we're not, the genetic, there's no genetic manipulation going on in the, that GM sense. Um, market assisted selection is very different. That's just another way of we're selecting the best genes by looking at the phenotype of the plant, the outward appearance. Well, this is just doing it another way, by looking at the in, internal appearance of the plant. So it's, it's, not, it's not genetic manipulation of it in any form. And does Helen have that question asked back to you, that inference asked back to you? No, I've, no, I've never had that question asked what you, uh, uh, you know, is, I've had the question, are you doing any GM breeding? Yes. Which the answer is no, we're not. We have that sort of question, but I've never been asked it in that, in that sort of concept with that inference from anybody, actually. So I'm quite glad Alan was here today. Yeah. It, I just find it interesting people aren't asking the question because the distinction isn't clear to the general population, yeah. even though it's yeah. clear to 
as his consultants. Um, it's, 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 it's not an issue behind it. We have, we'll have, there will always be somebody at the Royal World Show, for example, who will come on oh, sure. along and ask if we are using the genetic manipulation. We just, no, we're not. We're not, we're not, we're not allowed to. Yeah. The only GM work, if you would call it that, there is some research going on, but that is basically looking at the way um, the way the plant works, if you like, and the effect of the different genes. So it's, it's using GM, but that's to determine how the plant works. And it's very controlled, nothing comes out from the glass house, everything is destroyed. But none of the plants are actually bred using GM. It's all, it's all conventional breeding, which goes back many thousands of years. <laughs> Is it, is it, I think the thing is, is this sort of the general population and maybe the farming community. And I think the farming community understand, even subconsciously, that, that, that plant breeding is, is, you know, or grass plant breeding is, is crossing grass varieties and perennial ryegrass varieties and perennial ryegrass varieties. Admittedly, there's other work going on, but, you know, we're not actually trying to get a tomato into the, into the plant. And I think, you know, or, or whatever, you know, whereas do the public, how, how do the public perceive it? I don't know. Is It's maybe... There, there, there will always be some people who don't understand. Uh, again, from the world, I'll show an example. Uh, I think I was talking about uh, tetrapoid, producing tetrapoids. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, oh, that sounds like genetic manipulation. No, it's not. I, and then, I, you know, if you, I say, you know, you can, and hybridizing. Oh, she didn't like that at all. I said, well, wheat is a combination of, what is it, three, three species? Oh, I didn't know that. We have to do something about that. <laughs> so there'll always be people with that level of understanding anyway. And the best you can do is, is deliver our message to this conventional group. Thank you. Thank you.